from being with the church in Greece and different parts of Greece and uh, they all send their greetings to you. Uh, they said, pass on our greetings to your church and to the people in Vista and in Banbury. And um, it's interesting that we... Turn me down a little bit. I'm going louder around the not quieter. That sounds a bit better. Good. Um, it's interesting that we can send our greetings uh, we can say hello to people, um, but sometimes those greetings don't mean anything if we don't know who those people are. So they've sent their greetings to you, but it doesn't really mean a lot to you, does it? Uh, you don't know who they are, apart from it's nice that someone somewhere in different parts of Greece have said hello to you. Um, there's a little bit going on here in what uh, Paul is trying to get across to us. We're going to be looking at Colossians 2. Uh, if you've got your Bibles, you might want to turn to it. We're going to read a little bit. I'm going to read out loud, so don't worry if you haven't. But in Colossians 2, uh, the first few verses say this. I want you to know how hard I am contending for you and for those at Laodicea. So Colossians is one church in one area, Laodicea is another church in another area. And uh, Paul is in Rome, he's in prison, and, uh, and prison in those days was uh, under house arrest. So he's in a home, the only way he can communicate is by sending letters. He can't actually go and visit the churches like he'd really like to. And so he sends these letters. He says, my goal is that they may encourage in heart and united in love so that they may have a full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I tell you this, that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. For though I am absent from you in body, I am present with you in the spirit and delight to see how disciplined you are and how firm your faith in Christ is. He's sending, he's starting off in the letter or in this chapter of the letter by sending his greetings again. He said, I can't be there in person, but I'm sending this in my spirit. And uh, it was similar to my journey with these guys in Greece. I first visited the work and the churches out there in 2018 after hearing about them. Someone told me some stories, someone came and met me here and we chatted through and it didn't mean a lot until I got out there and I saw them and due to Covid uh, we've continued that relationship but over Zoom over the years uh, until finally getting out there again. I'd heard about them but there was a difference when I met them. And there's a difference when I met them again, that relationship continued to build. In this chapter, Paul is saying to us that what it's about is about knowing Jesus, knowing Christ. There's one thing about knowing Christ and knowing words or uh, information or knowledge about Christ. There's another thing about knowing Christ personally, knowing Jesus for ourselves, knowing that he is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, knowing that we can have a personal relationship with him. There's a difference there. And in this chapter, Paul's saying, don't worry, all you need to know is that it's all about Jesus. 
It's all about him. It's not just about hearing about Jesus, but it's about knowing him personally. You might remember the first time you ever heard of this person called Jesus. Maybe you were in school. Maybe it was in RE or in an assembly or RS as we might have called it. We call it different things in different places. Um, but you might have heard about it there. You might have heard about this Jesus when you went to church, you went to Sunday school. You might have just heard about this Jesus now. Might be the first time that you're hearing about it. You can know the facts, but there's a further step when we say yes to knowing him. And Paul wants to get across here that it's all about the relationship with Jesus. This Jesus who was sent as a baby, sent to this world, who became a man who was crucified in a horrible way and named King of the Jews. For some of you, you'll be able to remember the first day that you personally met Jesus, that you started that relationship knowing him, that it went from information to relationship. Jesus is everything. Jesus is our all and can be our all. Jesus was sent because God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. He so loved each and every one of us that he was prepared to send his son. Not only that, but that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. He didn't come to judge the world, but to save the world. And Paul wanted to remind them Hey, listen guys, it's all about Jesus. The Jesus that came to save you and me. To give us a hope and a future. He came to transform us from the inside out. He came to bring us forgiveness that we get to walk in a new life. Jesus sent by God the Creator and Redeemer. It's all about King Jesus. And in these first few verses, Paul is saying it's about finding the treasure. Um, I don't know if you've ever been on a treasure hunt. Uh, we often have them around Easter, don't we? On an Easter trail or a treasure hunt to find the different chocolates and things. Uh, it's exciting, isn't it? Oh, I find it exciting, anyway. <laughs> Looking for the prizes looking for where it might be, finding that treasure, or even reading in those books of those pirates that searched out for the treasure, following a map, digging it up, finding that the treasure wasn't really there, some of, that, some of the pirate had taken it, or whatever it might be. Here Paul's saying, you don't need to look any further, the treasure is Jesus Christ. That's who we need to look for. That's who we need to search for. Let's read a little bit more in Colossians uh, from verse 6. So then, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy which depends on human tradition and the element, elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. For in Christ 
all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. So he's a hundred percent God, a hundred percent man. And, and I know that doesn't add up, you can't be a hundred percent, one hundred percent, but it does. Uh, and in Christ you have been brought to fullness. He has heard over, he is, he is, I'll start again. He is the head over every power and authority. In him you were also circumcised with circumcision, not performed by human hands. Your whole self ruled by flesh was put off when you were circumcised by Christ. Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave all our sins, having cancelled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. I just want to take a few moments and unpack some of the things in that passage. Firstly, I want to talk about foundations. Uh, it talks about there in verse 6, so then, just as you receive Christ as the Lord, continue to live your lives in Him. Uh, we can tran we can talk about that or uh, transfer that word to walking in, living, walking in. Uh, that we are to receive Christ Jesus as our Lord. It's about receiving Jesus in our hearts, but it's also about bowing the knee. It's not just something about actually accepting God into our lives, but when you go and meet a royalty, when you meet a king or a queen, you courtesy or you bow the knee. Well, in this case, it's not a physical bowing out of, of the knee, but it's physically giving over our whole life. It's not just accepting Jesus into our hearts, but it's saying, Jesus, I give you my life for you to do what you want to do. I surrender myself to you. Receiving Christ as Lord means giving our life over him, to him. It means a, a public testimony. Not only do we receive it in our hearts and we say, Jesus, have your way, but we say, Jesus, show us how we're to live, how we live differently, how we show others that actually there's a different way to live that's not of this world. When I was in Greece, I met uh, a lady who's uh, she has been through terrible circumstances, and uh, this lady uh, isn't from Greece. She's from another country, and in her country, knowing Jesus. Uh, isn't something that's allowed. And she met Jesus and she gave her life to him. And she decided that she wouldn't just give Jesus, say, Jesus, come into my life, but she would bow the knee and ask him to transform her. She didn't just stop there, but she decided that he was worth living for and showing others what Jesus was really like. And she was kicked out by her husband. She was divorced. 
She could no longer live in that country. She was, had to flee and move to another country. She then tried to seek ref refugee status in another country again and was returned. She is now in Greece and she is a wonderful lady that is reaching others and telling others about the Jesus that she knows. And people respect her and honour her. People are looking up to her from different countries that have also been kicked out of theirs. And she's showing that there's a different way to live. She's showing them God's love. That's one lady. When I went to a, a northern part of Greece, to a place uh, called Yanina, and uh, there's many refugee camps in Greece, and one of the churches there is working and helping in this camp, and uh, is providing help and aid, but it's also telling them about Jesus. And one of the days, uh, we managed to sneak into this refugee camp. Uh, we had to go over the fence and go in the back way uh, to get in. We're not meant to be in there. And uh, I, I met in this home, if you can call it home, this hut, one room, this group of people that are about to flee and leave everything behind. They're given absolutely nothing. And live in this place. And yet, they have a hope. And they are thankful. And some of them have met Jesus. And have realised that he's worth living for. And their lives have been transformed. And I was overwhelmed. They've got nothing. Absolutely nothing. A persecuted, potentially will be kicked out by their friends and peers because of their faith. But one thing they hold on to is they give thanks. They're thankful for the so little that they have. And they praise God. And they look to tell others. They've accepted him into their lives and they bow their knee. And I was overwhelmed. And made me think, it is all about Jesus. And they have struggles and they have problems and life isn't easy for them but yet they give thanks and they praise him and i know we have troubles and we have difficulties and we have situations that are tough and hard i know catherine hasn't found this week as easy <laughs> with me not being around. But we have so much to be thankful for. It makes me want to give thanks to Christ for who he is and what he has done. And it's changing my perspective. We're called to walk with him. It then says, verse 7, to be rooted and to be built up. This is what these people are doing out there. They're rooting themselves in Christ and they're being built up. And when hurricanes come, you often see pictures of absolute devastation. 
You see houses squashed and flattened. You see debris scattered over. But when you look at these pictures, you'll see that some trees are still standing. That brick building has been decimated, or that wooden building has been decimated. But that tree is standing strong and firm. And here Paul's saying, it's all about Christ and about putting your roots in him. A tree's roots goes deep and far. So that when the hurricanes come, when the stuff of life comes that's difficult and hard, and we don't know what to do about it, we still stand firm. We still stand strong, unlike the houses that are decimated. And then he calls us to be built up. That he wants to build something inside us. He wants us to have solid foundations in which he changes us. There's a story in the Gospels, uh, you might have even sung it, about a man who built his house on the beach and the man that built his house on a rock. Yeah, some of us are nodding. And Jesus tells this story that the man who built on the beach, the waves came and washed it away. But the man that built it on the rock, the waves came and it stayed strong. And that's what Jesus wants to do in us. He says, hey, come and put your roots deep inside of me. Come and fix your eyes on me. And I want to build you stronger. I know those of you that love languages are going, that metaphor doesn't work. Trees and buildings in one thing, but hey, Paul does it, so there we go. He then goes on to say, be strengthened in faith. In the gospel message of Jesus. I remember the day in which some guy was preaching at the front and he was telling me about God's love and about acceptance and about hope and how I didn't have to be the person that I thought I had to be, but it was a different way of living. I remember that. I remember that transformation that went on as if this guy was only speaking at me and I was the only person in the room. And it changed my life forever. It's been hard, it's been tough. I've lost people, I've walked through difficult situations. But I know that Jesus is the place in which I can have faith and I can have trust. And Paul here says, remember that day. Remember that day and take strength from it. Because the winds are going to come. The struggles are going to come. The things are going to come to knock us down. But if we put our roots deep in him. He then goes on in verse 7 to say it's about thanksgiving. It's by grace that we get to know Jesus. We don't deserve it. We all do things wrong. We all mess up. The Bible talks about it, calls it, calls it sin. We all do those things. We don't deserve necessarily to be freed. But yet Jesus came, not only did he die on that cross, but he rose again and conquered death so that we may be freed. So that in fact, we can give thanks. 
because it's by his grace that we are saved. It's not by anything that we can do. We can't add to Jesus. Sometimes I think we try and we think we should. And we think, oh, only if I do this would it make things better. We don't need to add to it. This is Jesus. This is what Paul is trying to say. The treasure is Jesus. He is everything that we need. That if we put our roots down, we will be built up. Now it's easy to say all that, isn't it? It's easy to spout those words. But there are things that help us. Meeting with other people. Meeting with other Christians. Coming on Sunday. Coming to our midweek groups. If you don't know what happens in our midweek communities, come and ask me. We have groups that meet and spend time with God. We need to read our Bibles. If we're going to put our roots down deep, if we're going to stay in the course, we've got to be in His Word. I don't know about you, but sometimes I've read it and I think, oh, I don't know what that's about. I don't understand that bit. But then something happens in the day and you think, ah, was exactly what I was just reading. Or that word jumps off the page and hits you and you think, wow. That's just a source of encouragement to us. It's about praying. Those people in Greece, you don't know them, but they send their greetings. Jesus Christ and it's not a one way relationship but it's a two way relationship not only does he want to speak to us, not only does he want to come and say hey would you bow the knee would you fully live for me but he wants to say hey come and talk to me come and tell me your concerns and your worries come and tell me how your day has been There's one thing when we pray together, we, can, we pray in certain ways. But praying on our own, just have a conversation between you and God, there's nothing like it. Hey God, I'm, I'm struggling today, I don't want to get out of bed. This is how I'm feeling. This is what's going on. He wants to hear that. He wants that two-way relationship. Hey, God, my work's really tough and rubbish and I hate it. He cares about those things. We need to be giving thanks. And we can do that in our prayer lives as well. In the first chapter, which I spoke about a few weeks ago, if you haven't missed one, by the way, they're on YouTube. I don't know if we've ever said that before, but we'll put that there. If you haven't missed a Sunday, you can watch it again on YouTube and watch just the talk if you want to. But in chapter one, Paul talks about it being about Thanksgiving. Let's give thanks. If we want to be rooted in Christ and built up, one of the ways is to give thanks. Even for the smallest of things. I was thankful for my bed last night. <laughs> I've been sleeping in different places, on different beds different areas, with different animals, making different noises at different times, 
and hasn't been a lot of sleep. I was thankful for my bed last night. The smallest of things. I was grateful for that. Do we want King Jesus to be king over our lives? Are we prepared to bow the knee? Not only accept him in our hearts, but bow the knee. Let him build us up so that we can show others who Jesus is. Show him that our lives can be transformed. Show them the love of God that is there. It's all about Jesus, but it's not easy to stay on course. In verse 8, it says, See to it that no one takes captive, though through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. It talks further down, I'm going to summarise this quite quickly and finish, but it talks further down about being circumcised. Uh, that was a Jewish practice and the church in Colossians was uh, getting different messages to them saying, you're not really a Christian if you haven't been circumcised. It was people speaking false teachings. And so Paul's addressing that and saying, hey, it's not, it's not about those things. It's not about false teaching. It's about Christ is enough. Jesus is enough. A few is in the room and go, few. I don't need to be circumcised. Notice how many of the ladies laughed at that. <laughs> uh, and so that's going on there in Colossians. That they've got people saying things to them and trying to take them off track. I think that happens today. We don't have people come and say you must be circumcised to be a Christian. We have people bringing in world views. We have people putting doubt in our minds. We walk through situations and think, God, why? Who are you? Why would you even let me walk through this? Are you even real? Are you even there? Paul says Christ is enough. Let's not get sucked into the mentality or the worldviews or the things that are there to trip us up. Maybe even it's around a religiousness that trips us up, that we think we ought to do this and that. And it has to be done in a certain way. And if we haven't done it, we're not really a Christian. I'm going to say something a bit radical. Do you know what? If you haven't read your Bible one day, it doesn't mean you're not a Christian. It's okay. I'm not condoning it. I'm not saying don't ever read your Bible. I'm not being that radical. But you know what? It's, it's not about religiousness. It's not about doing something because we ought to do it. But it's about going, hey, I want to spend time reading my Bible because it brings me closer to Jesus Christ. Because I know it does me good. Because I know God will speak to me through it. It's not a religiousness that we approach things. 
It's not about, oh, I haven't prayed enough today. It's not about those things. It's about Jesus being enough that pushes us then to want to spend more time with him. I've come back from meeting with these churches in Greece and actually, I can't wait to get back. Because I've, I, there's a connection there. I can't wait to take you with me. I can't wait for them to come over here and for them to meet you. Because there's a relationship there. I can't wait to see each and every one of us knowing Jesus Christ more and more. Knowing he's our saviour, knowing that he's king of kings and lord of lords. Paul is saying, watch out for the false teachings. Maybe it's even books. You know, there's loads of writers out there that write Christian books. And some of them are absolutely fabulous. Being radical again. Do you know what? Some of them are absolute garbage. And they're not biblical. And there is a degree of an awareness we need to have with that. Our truth comes from the Bible. I'm not saying we don't read other books, I read them all the time. But we need to approach them with eyes that go, is this in the Bible? Where would Christ be in this? What does that look like? Paul's saying there's a different circumcision that wants to go on. A circumcision of the heart and the body that Jesus Christ wants to come and transform us. Not a circumcision of the flesh. Today I believe God wants to bring us a fresh freedom that we would know Christ evermore, that we would know him afresh, that we would know that he's for us, that he cares for us, that he loves us, that he would give us a fresh freedom to walk through our struggles and challenges that we face in life. And know that he is enough. That he is our all. That even when it's tough, he is there with us. I'd love to finish by praying. Why don't we close our eyes? helps us to focus. There's a song, I'm not going to sing it, but Christ is enough for us. Christ is all that we need. doesn't mean that life is going to be easy. doesn't mean that there aren't going to be challenges. doesn't mean that God doesn't think our challenges and difficulties are any less than those that I've told stories about in different places. He values each one of us just as much. And so just with your eyes closed, just ask God to speak to you. Ask him to reveal something. Maybe something you need freedom in. Maybe it's bowing the knee again. Maybe today it's about knowing Jesus Christ for the first time. 
and accept asking him to be part of your life. So Father God, we thank you that you sent your Son, born of a baby, became a man, died on a cross, crucified King of the Jews, yet conquered death defeats Satan, rises again, lives today. Thank you, Lord, that it's you that we follow, that you are enough, that you are our all and everything, that you are enough for each and every one of us. Thank you, Lord, that we can put our roots in you. And I pray for those that need help putting their roots deep down in you, that they need help for their ground to be moved away and for the roots to go deeper, to take practical steps to do that. I pray would you help them to do that. Would this week be a starting point of doing that? Lord, for those that need to bow the knee fresh again and say, Lord God, I, I give you my life. I don't just want to know you, but I want to be transformed by you. I bow the knee to King Jesus. And I say, Lord God, have your way. Would you come and meet us right now? Come and bring a fresh acceptance, a fresh love, a fresh care. Lord, would you come and meet each and every one of us right now? For those that don't know you yet, would you come and come and meet them in their hearts? Come and dwell with them right now. Come and pour out your Holy Spirit. Come and dwell with us. In Jesus' name, amen.